All right, uh, today's lecture is going to be on naming and writing chemical formulas. Um, I think it's a very important concept. Um, I think writing formulas, balance equations, is a hallmark of chemistry. Um, now, while the national exam has taken quite a bit of it out for scoring purposes, it still will constitute a few points here and there. And I think they're points that you can easily get, um, and it's something that throughout the whole year, you being able to write formulas and understand chemical makeup is a very, very important topic. Okay, um, what I've given you down below is an example of a flow chart. So um, with this flow chart you see at the bottom, this is a way for you to kind of determine how you should name the chemical compound. And something we'll briefly talk about too as we have some different examples. Um, but before we get into naming, again, just a couple of common things to kind of understand. Again, a molecule up above is where we are looking at, in essence, two nonmetals. I say two or more. Could be three or more. If you have two or more nonmetals bonded together, it typically is going to form a molecule. And that's an example of a covalently bonded compound. And when we name it, it has a different naming system than when it's ionic. An ionic compound, again, remember the key thing with an ionic compound is that it's going to contain a metal and a non-metal if it um, is a binary compound. If it has more than two elements, then again, it'll typically have a metal plus a polyatomic ion. The other possibility is if it starts with NH4 plus one. If it starts with the ammonium ion, those are the classic examples of if it's an ionic compound, okay? Uh, if it's a molecule, it's going to usually contain, a national exam is going to contain two nonmetals. We just have to name it. So most often it's going to be something like carbon dioxide, uh, dinitrogen pentoxide, things like that. All right. The last thing and the, probably the hardest thing to name is going to be your acids. And we'll briefly go over that coming up. Okay. Again, a chemical formula represents um, the number of each number of each atoms or elements that is present in one unit of that material. The subscript tells me how many there are in a single unit. Diatomic molecules um, are any molecules that are made up of two atoms. For example, carbon monoxide is an example of a diatomic molecule because it's chemically bonded together and there's two atoms that make it up. There are also diatomic elements where even though it, there's a bond there, it's not a compound, but it's an element. Um, a easy way to remember this a little hominin called Hofbrinkel. Okay, Hofbrinkel is an easy way to remember the seven diatomic elements. So usually, when you have an element in a chemical reaction, they are monatomic. If it's one of these seven elements, then it is diatomic: hydrogen, oxygen, fluorine, bromine, iodine nitrogen, and chlorine, okay? The other way you can remember it is on the periodic table. When you see the periodic table, is that the elements will form a seven, okay? And that'll be your nitrogen, oxygen, chlorine, okay? Uh, oh, excuse me, nitrogen, fluorine, my bad, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. So they'll form the seven for the seven diatomic elements, and you just have to remember that hydrogen is diatomic over here. So it's the number seven with hydrogen, another way of remembering the elements that are diatomic, okay? Molecular compounds, again, are compounds that have that are, have molecules as their units, and that's because it's uh, covalently bonded together. They share electrons. Ionic compounds, they transfer electrons. There's a positive ion and a negative ion, and again, we call those positive and negative ions cations and anions. Um, Empirical formulas, which we'll talk about more in the next unit, that's going to be where uh, it is the simplest ratio of atoms that forms a single unit, okay, um, and so on and so forth. Uh, polyatomic ion, as we've said before, is more than one atom put together where the grouping of those uh, particles, the bonding of those particles, forms a charged particle, okay, polyatomic ion. Um, while this class is primarily inorganic chemistry, many times on national exam you will see organic chem uh, compounds given in some of the chemical reactions, and that's just because of the prevalent nature of organic compounds in and around our world. 
So even though this is inorganic chemistry, you're not going to be expected to have to name organic compounds, but I understand there's going to be a lot of chemical reactions or problems in which you are going to be working with compounds that are organic. Okay? All right, let's take a look at the next page first. To name chemical compounds when I go back, the key thing is to look at the formula. How many atoms do you have? How many different elements do you have? If you have only two elements, if you have only two elements, the key is looking at the first element. The first element tells you a lot. If the first element, if it begins with a metal, okay, then it is going to be an ionic compound. If it does not contain a metal, then it is going to be not an ionic compound. The next question is, if it is not an ionic compound and it only contains two elements, X and Y, is that first element hydrogen? If it is, if an element, B, if a compound starts with H, it is an acid, okay? It's also an acid that contain, could contain either a polyatomic ion or a single element, okay? Which would then be called a binary acid, I mean, where it only has two different elements, okay? If it doesn't begin with an acid, then what you have is you have a substance in which it is both elements are nonmetals. If they are both nonmetals, then we are going to utilize prefixes. Okay, mono, di, tri. Okay, um, four is tetra. Okay, then we get to penta, hexa, hepta, octa, nana, deca. We're going to use prefixes to indicate how many of each of the elements we have. So if you have a formula X2, Y3, this would be an example of dye, whatever the chemical compound is. And the first element, we do not change its ending. ending. Okay, so if the element would be, um, if it be um, sulfur, we would say disulfur. And if the second compound was oxygen, we would say disulfur trioxide. The last element always ends in ide. Okay? We don't use the prefix mono, again, if the first element, so CO2, we don't say monocarbon dioxide, we say carbon dioxide. Okay? All right. Um, what happens if we do begin with a metal? If it begins with a metal, then the question becomes, is it a transition metal? Transition metals are elements in the D block. So in the periodic table, we're talking about the elements in groups 3 through 12. If the element, if the metal's in 3 through 12, you should use Roman numerals that indicate the charge of the metal ion. For example, if we had CuBr2. Bromine is a halogen. The halogens are in group 17. All halogens have a charge of negative 1. Since there's two of them, we know the total charge of the two bromines is negative two, which means the copper has to be plus two. So when I name this chemical compound, it isn't just simply copper bromide. We have to include, because copper is in the D block, we have to include a Roman numeral to indicate its charge, because copper, like many of the elements in the D block, has more than one oxidation state. So to name it, we would say copper two bromide. So. If the metal is in the D block, we have to use Roman numerals that is the charge. Not how many of them we have, but the charge on that metal. If the metal is in groups one or two, or are in below the red staircase, if you have any metals in these areas here, we do not need necessarily to include um, Roman numerals for them, okay? Um, naming ionic compounds in, the, the, if it's a binary compound where there's just two elements, like bro, copper bromide here, the last element, bromine, always ends in ide. So if it's a diatomic ionic compound, the second element always is ide, just like covalent compounds. If it contains a polyatomic ion, you just have to know what the name of that polyatomic ion is. Okay? I will have online also a practice page that you can go up to a website that it will give you randomized many different chemical compounds that you can practice naming. Again, this is just something that comes down to you and how hard and how much effort you're going to put into to get naming. Some of you are very good at naming. It comes naturally to you. You don't have to spend a lot of time in this. Others of you, 
you might need to spend more time and more practice. And again, just make a daily habit to maybe try to do five, 10 compounds a day and just get practice using that website. So that'll be up online for you to try if you want extra practice. All right, here's a particular representation or breakdown of substances if you were to analyze them. Real quickly, just as a review, looking at each of these particles, um, pause the lecture for a second. Tell me what you think each of these is. So when I look at A, and this is the particulate representation, okay, what is this classified as? Is this a pure substance? Is it a mixture? If it is a pure substance, is it an element or compound? Um, and just real briefly describe what each would be, okay? All right, A, is this a mixture or a pure substance? You should say it's a pure substance because all the particles are exactly the same. And you'll notice that you have a red sphere and a blue sphere, which identifies different elements. This would be an example of a chemical compound. Okay. B, pure substance or mixture? This is a mixture. It's a mixture because not all the atoms of the particles are exactly the same. This would be an example of a mixture in which we happen to have um, an element, because we see monatomic element that has just its atoms, and then a diatomic Element. So we have, in this case, there are two different elements that make up this mixture, okay? C, again, this is a mixture. This would be a mixture, this would be a chemical compound, and this would be a monatomic element where its particles exist as atoms. That would be a mixture. D, that's a pure substance because all the particles are the same. That would be an example of a compound. E, this is a little bit more tricky. This is a pure substance, but this is an element. Because all the atoms are the same, it's a diatomic element. This would be one of the seven diatomic elements. Okay, F, pretty simple. F would be an example of a pure substance. This would be just an element, specifically an element that's monatomic. It's particles that exist as single atoms. G, we see that this is a mixture of two different chemical compounds. Okay, because each of the Particles. There's two different chemical compounds illustrated by the different colored spheres. H, this would be a pure substance. And if you look at it, how the particles are arranged, would this be in the solid, liquid, or gaseous state? This would be the solid state because they are so tightly packed in a uniform configuration. So this would be an example of a pure substance that's in the solid state. And letter I, this too is a pure substance but it would be a compound because, again, all the particles are the same. Um, that makes it a pure substance, but in this case, it would be a compound. All right. So being able to identify something as an element or mixture compound by particular representations, again, something that's very important when it comes to the national exam. And in this unit, also when we get into the next chapter, chapter 3, the chemical reactions utilizing particular representations. All right, to do the third page here. Now, this is not in your packet. I just randomly throwed some compounds up here. If you want right now, you can pause the lecture and annotate on here and see if you can get the right names of the chemical formula compounds. If you need to go back, you can go back and look at that flow chart um, and then pause the lecture. And then real quickly here, I'll regain the lecture and go through these chemical compounds. All right. Uh, the first one, I apologize. I didn't even realize that it was one that I had already given you. Yes, this is an example of copper to bromide. Copper, again, is in the D block. We need to use Roman numerals. And bromine has changed the bromide for the ionic compound. Ni3. Nitrogen is a nonmetal. Therefore, these, these are two nonmetals put together. Again, when we do the periodic table, put that red staircase in that starts by bromine. Any element to the right of that staircase we treat as a nonmetal. So if you have two elements in this area that are put together, now we have to use prefixes. So this would be an example of nitrogen triiodide. HF. HF. If it begins with H, it is an acid. If it contains just one other element, then to name these acids, we use the common formula, hydroblank ic acid. All we do is we put in the name, the root name of whatever the second element is. So if you have an acid that does not contain oxygen, 
we will say hydroblankic acid. In this case, the blank, the X is an F, which is fluorine. So we would say hydrofluoric acid. Okay. Next one, Mg over here. It's a metal. It's an ionic compound. We just name it. Mg is magnesium. The first element, we always just name its elemental name. PO4, that's a polyatomic ion, and whenever we have parentheses, we know it's a polyatomic ion. PO4 is called phosphate, magnesium phosphate. Okay. FeOH3, Fe is iron. Iron is in the D block. If it's in the D block, we need Roman numerals. This is iron. OH is hydroxide. Hydroxide has a charge of negative 1, but there's three of them, which means that's a total of negative 3. Since we have only one iron, we know that iron has to have a 3 charge, and therefore we're going to call it iron 3 hydroxide. TiSO4 2, Ti is in the D block, it's titanium. Okay, SO4, polyatomic ion, is called sulfate. Sulfate has a negative 2 charge times 2. And again, if you're not very good at polyatomic ions, there's that first page of the packet that you can do practice or you can fill it out. You can always then look back at that polyatomic ion for naming purposes. Okay, since there's two of them, that's a total of negative 4. So that one titanium must have a charge of 4. So this would be titanium 4 sulfate. Okay, writing formulas. Sodium is Na. Sodium is in group 1. Any element in group 1 will have a plus 1 charge. If it's group 2, it'll be plus 2. If it's group 13, it'll be plus 3, which will be any element below the staircase will have a plus 3 charge. If it's in group 14, it'll have a plus 4 charge if it is below the staircase. Okay. In the D block, most of these elements have plus 1 or plus 2. Some have plus 3, some have plus 4. It all depends. And that usually we get from the chemical formula. Chlorate. If something ends in 8, that means it contains oxygen. So we know it's chlorine and oxygen. Now you just have to remember how much. Chlorate is 3 oxygens. Chlorate has a charge of negative 1. Plus one, negative one, since they balance, it's a one-to-one -one ratio. There's the formula of sodium chlorate. Dinitrogen penoxide, we see prefixes. The prefixes tell me the numbers, the subscripts. So two nitrogens and five oxygens. Lead for nitrate. Lead is PB. The four tells me it's a charge of plus four. Nitrate, again, it ends in eight is oxygen. Nitrate is NO3. Nitrate has a charge of negative 1. Since the charges do not balance, we have to cross drop. And that tells me I need 4 negative 1 nitrates to equal the 1 lead plus 4. To get negative 4 and plus 4 to balance. Hypochlorous acid. We see the word acid, so right away it begins with H. Hypochlorous. What we do not see is hydro. What that tells me Chlorus is that it contains chlorine and oxygen. If we do not see hydroblankic acid, if this was hydrochloric acid, it would just simply be HCl. But because there isn't hydroic acid, I know it contains a polyatomic ion. That polyatomic ion is ClO. And what do we name ClO? Hypochlorite. With acids, if it ends in us, it's because the polyatomic ion ended in ite. If it ends in ic, it's because the polyatomic ion ended in eight, and vice versa. So us tells me it's ite. This is hypochlorite. The charge on hypochlorite is negative one. Hydrogen, acid, always plus one. That balances the formulas HClO hypochlorous acid. Carbon disulfide, again, we see the prefix di, so I don't have to worry about charges. Carbon and two sulfurs. The second element always ends in ide. Potassium iodide, potassium is K. Iodide comes from iodine, which is the element I. Potas potassium is a group one, so it's plus one. Iodide is a halogen, 
the halogens are minus one. So group 17, minus one almost always. Group 16, oxygen family, negative two, negative two. Nitrogen, negative three. Those are the typical charges based on placement of the periodic table, okay? So plus one, minus one, again, it balances the formulas Ki. So that's a quick rundown on naming and how to name chemical compounds. You've done it before in regulars or honors chemistry. It's just about a matter of doing, getting a lot of practice and just getting comfortable with it. So on the next page, just problems. We'll be completing this page in your packet. So go ahead and complete it. I will post the answer key online as well for you to check it over. If you have any questions on naming, just ask. Um, I will also put up a website that you can log into for extra practice in naming and writing formulas. Um, so make use of that if you need extra practice on writing chemical formulas and naming. Uh, in your test for this first unit exam, you will have a section on naming and writing formulas. So it'll be part of your FRQ score. So just be aware of that. Um, it's not worth all of the points, but it is worth some of the points. And so make sure you have a good foothold in that. And again, if you have questions, ask me. Thanks for listening.